Thank you, Stefan. Thank you all for coming. Hello. I'm really happy to see you there. So today I'm going to introduce my thesis, where I've been interested in assessing evolutionary potential in a wide broad population. So I would like to start my talk with a general observation, which is that every organism has to face environmental heterogeneity, either being natural or induced by human. Yet, when it's induced by human, as you may see on this picture, it can lead to extreme changes and often at a faster pace than if it was natural. So that's why we've kept to wonder in the literature how organisms respond to environmental heterogeneity. So in general, it is said that there is three options. The first one is just to go away and to find a more suitable environment which is the case, for example, of the oyster catcher, who just move away the nest from the shore to avoid flooding events. Another option is to stay in the environment, but to modify it to make it more suitable, which is, for example, the case of the silvery moonrays, which is going to modify its habitat to make it more suitable by building burrows, and the architecture of the burrows is going to be modified according to environmental conditions such as food. Finally, the last option is to stay, but to change phenotype, which is the case of red deer, where uh, it has been shown that their parturition date has been advanced in two weeks in nearly four decades due to advanced peak in resources availability. So we can see that organisms have three options to deal with environmental heterogeneity and changes. But one of the very first ways to deal with it may be through movement behavior. Because movement allows to meet and to respond to the different environmental factors, either being positive or negative factors. For example, movement can allow to find resources, to find partners to mate, to avoid competition or even to avoid predation, and hence it's related to survival and reproduction. So that's why we need to understand movement behavior if we want to understand how organisms can respond to environmental heterogeneity. So when we are talking and studying environmental heterogeneity, we can see it at multiple spatial but also temporal scale. And it's the same thing for the movement. For example, we can classify movement in infrequent large-scale movement, which is the case of migration movement, for example, migration has been shown to help red deer to track temporally changing food. But we can also classify it in frequent small-scale movement, such as habitat use. And habitat use has been shown to help mooses to thermoregulate when the summer temperature is increasing. So for example, the mooses, moose are going to shift from open habitat to more dense canopy forests. So we can see that there might be multiple movement strategies to deal with environmental changes and environmental heterogeneity. Most of the time, traditionally in the literature, when we are studying response to environmental heterogeneity, we have been done it at the population level. So we are going to say this most population increase its forest use when the summer temperature is increasing. Yet, in the literature, it has been shown also that not every individual are going to have the same response to environmental heterogeneity and that there might be among individual variation and those among individual variation might be due for example to genetic variation or to permanent environmental variation so for example when there is different exposure to environment Finally, inside the population, there might be also um, variation within the individual, and this might be due, for example, to environmental fluctuation, and so on. So, the general aim of my thesis was to decompose the movement behavior to variation, sorry, to understand uh, how organisms can respond to environmental changes. And particularly, we focus if that could be. Um, changes in the phenotype, in the movement phenotype. So in, it is said in general that there is two main mechanisms to change phenotypes. So the first mechanisms may be environmentally induced mechanisms, which is the case, for example, when there is plastic response. 
So elastic response is when one genotype is going to produce is going to produce several phenotypes under different environmental conditions. But there might be also mechanisms genetically induced, which is the case of microevolutionary responses. So when there is genetic variation transmitted to the next generation and that provides some fitness benefits. So the study of these different mechanisms have been mainly studied in the literature. For example, in the red deer, it has been shown that um, change in phenotypes might be due to both mechanisms. While in the hihi and in the clownfish, it has been shown if there is uh, changes, um, it has been shown to be due only to environmentally induced mechanisms. So different mechanisms mean different evolutionary dynamics, and that's why we need to understand the underlying mechanisms to be able to predict the ability of population to persist when they are confronted to environmental changes. Particularly, we have a need to understand the, to characterize the evolutionary potential of wild population. So evolutionary potential is the potential to respond to selection and, um, and we can assess it through two different metrics. So through heritability or evolvability. So heritability is a percentage of phenotypic variation in a trait due to genetic variation. So it gives an idea of the potential of a population to respond to selection. While evolvability gives an idea of the expected percentage of change in a non-constraint in a trait per generation if it is submitted to selection. So to assess the evolutionary potential, we need to have access to genetic variation and to have access to genetic variation we need to estimate the relativeness between individuals, but also to use quantitative genetic animal model, so to decompose the phenotypic variation of the trait. Traditionally, this has been done by using and estimating multigenerational pedigree, yet uh, with this kind of method, we need to sample a large percentage of the population, and we need also to have several generations. So, for the moment, the study of evolutionary potential has been for long-term monitoring design and so to only some species, while we have a need to, have to draw more general pattern. So that's why, in the first part of my talk, I will address the question how to assess evolutionary potential of species in the wild without access to pedigree. On top of that, due to this um, method too, the evolutionary potential of behavior have been poorly investigated. For example, here you can see the relative number of studies um, of studies estimating heritability for, for behavior in green and morphological traits in blue. Despite this, we know that behavior has the potential to change in response to selection because it has been shown to be heritable at nearly 20%. And uh, furthermore, it has been most of the time done in, done in uh, semi-domestic or domestic population. But concerning large-scale large movement behavior, we know that migration or dispersal can be heritable at nearly 45%. But we know little about fine-scale movement behavior, so more routine movement behavior. So that's why in the second part of my talk, I will address the question do individuals have the potential to respond to environmental changes through macroevolutionary changes in fine-scale movement behavior? Finally, when we assess evolutionary potential in the wild, it might be quite challenging because there is a lot of uncontrolled condition. And uh, for example, it's possible that relatives that share the same genes might also share some food resources, some hormones, and hence there might be some parental effect that may be confronted, confronted with a genetic variation. But more importantly, in the white, it's possible that due to limited dispersal and to spatial heterogeneity, that relative that share genes are also going to share the same environment. 
And this might be a problem because if we misestimate the genetic variation, we're also going to misestimate the prediction in response to selection. So surprisingly, there have been a few studies in the literature studying uh, this kind of um, effect. And furthermore, the conclusions are not unanimous. So that's why, in the last part of my talk, I will address the question how does environmental similarity influence the estimation of evolutionary potential of population? So to do a quick sum up, we have seen that movement might help to might help to mitigate environmental changes and that we need to decompose phenotypic variants to understand if uh, it can change through microevolutive or plastic response. But for that, we need to overcome a first hindrance, which is that we need to understand how are we going to assess evolutionary potential without a pedigree. So after, we can calculate heritability and evolvability of movement and try to understand if those metrics might be biased through, for example, environmental similarity, even if there is much more um, effect that could bias our estimate. So to respond to this question, we focus on the European road deer, which is an angulate and in a very contrasting environment. So with a high temporal and spatial um, heterogeneity, it was first a forest dwelling species, but it has also colonized the growth system and we can find found uh, it everywhere and um, the, the agro-system provides them a high quality and quantity of food yet it is often at the expense of shelters. So uh, the individuals are going to face a special temporal trade-off in risk and benefit and this might impact the survival and the reproduction. All the more due to their close interaction with humans which might cause, for example, a car collision or even uh, being a hunting population. So, we focus on a population inhabiting in the south of France because it's a population that inhabits a highly heterogeneous habitat. As you can see on this map, it's really patchy with a forest in the green, meadow in the light green and crops in yellow. We, uh, we capture individuals each winter, so it allows us to sex and age individuals, but also to get the body mass and uh, some uh, tissue sample to extract DNA. But more importantly, we feed them a GPS collar before they get released, and it allows us to understand the center of their home range. So for example, here each red point is the center of one individual home range. And furthermore, thanks to a GPS collar, we can also understand how individuals are going to move across uh, the environmental heterogeneity. And here you can see the trajectories of one individual during one day. So the problem with this population is that due to a high individual turnover and to medium capture rate, we, it's not possible to have access to pedigree. And uh, that's why I would like to talk uh, about that. So, as I told you, um, pedigree might be uh, quite constraining to assess relatedness among individuals. Uh, and a while ago, solutions have been proposed like the use of genotype markers. Yet, at the, for the moment, only low-density markers were available, such as microsatellites. And it has been shown to uh, misestimate the relatedness among individuals. Yet now, um, there have been advances in high-throughput sequencing technologies and it's possible to have access to high-density markers such as SNPs which provide a more precise relatedness estimate than do pedigree. So there is plenty of methods to, to obtain SNPs, uh, even there is some method uh, without prior genomic knowledge, yet it has been under critics because it is consider considered as generating high missing data and high genotyping error rate. But also there is a lot of critical bioinformatic decision to do and this might impact our evolutionary potential estimate. Surprisingly, there have been a few practical framework in the literature and that was the aim of the first part of my thesis. So we first try to understand how do we go from raw genomic data to the first heritability estimate 
So really quickly, you, once you have your markers, you have to rebuild. Once you have your genomic data, you have to rebuild your markers. So you have to choose a strategy to rebuild it. So what are going to be, what the strategy is going to be? Once you have your markers, you have to keep only biological markers, and you have to be sure not to have artifactual markers. So what quality filters are you going to apply? Once you have your markers, you can then estimate your first relatedness estimate, but you have to be sure it's reliable relatedness. And finally, you can run your quantitative genetic animal model and have your first heritability estimate. Yet, as you must have noticed, heritability estimate may, might depend on the choice you've made just previously. So we investigated this question, and for this we focused on the raw deer population, for which we had no prior genomic knowledge and no pedigree. And we focused on the heritability of body mass, because it's a well-studied trait in the Hagulet literature. So I will go really quickly because I don't have time for this, but we have found that in our data set, there have been low error but also missing data rates with only 0.4 to 1%. We found that the relatedness estimates are close to field non relatedness but more importantly, we found the heritability of main opotimas were coherent with the Hagulets but also the Rhodium literature and furthermore were quite robust to the choice we've made previously. So here we can say that we validated this method, which allowed us to estimate a genomic relatedness matrices with more than 15,000 markers on more than 300 individuals. So just to conclude this part, we have seen that genomic advances for web population can help to estimate evolutionary potential in virtually any natural species and this instantaneously. So the first aim was to calculate heritability of body mass, but once we have done it, we wanted to calculate heritability of movement behavior. So thus to understand if movement behavior can change through microevolutionary responses. So to answer to this, uh, we need to have access to two things. So first we need to have access to relatedness, so what I've shown to you just before. But we also need to have access to behavior, and for this we use advances in biologic technologies. So biologic technologies allow to track individual displacements among environmental heterogeneity, and this at any spatial but also temporal scale. So we can understand how individuals is going to interact with the environmental heterogeneity. For example, in our population, we have been able to uh, calculate the probability, the probability of being in open habitat of being in open habitat by day. We have been also able to calculate the distance to road by day. So by day because it's when human disturbance is higher. And we also calculated the daily average speed of individuals. So altogether it allowed us to understand how organisms are going to cope with uh, the trade-off between risk avoidance and resources acquisition. So, in general, in the literature, biologists have helped to understand that individuals do not, do not have the same movement strategies to respond to environmental factors, yet we still know little about mechanisms underlying this movement behavior. And to understand it, we need to combine genomic and biologic data technologies but for now, it has been a missed opportunity. So we have done it for the road deer population, and the aim was to decompose the phenotypic variation of our just movement behavior, so probability of being in open habitat, distance to road, and daily average speed. We decompose the phenotypic variance first into among and within individual variation, and then we decompose it a little further into genetic and permanent environmental variation. Then we have set the different metrics to have evolutionary potential, such as evolvability and heritability. So
So what you can see in this graph is the decomposition of phenotypic variation for being in open habitat, distance to road, and daily average speed. And we can see that we have high heritability, so heritability is in dark grey. So high heritability for being in open habitat and distance to road, but um, moderate heritability for daily average speed. So those heritability comes also with evolvability. And we have an evolvability of 1.1 for distance to road and 2.4 for daily average speed. And we did not calculate it, um, we did not calculate evolvability for being in open habitat because it was not meaningful. So here we found that there is significant heritability and evolvability, which means that road deer have the potential to respond to selective pressure. To give an example, if there is direction, directional selection in the population, it means that the traits can change from 1.1 to 2.4 percent per generation. So, for example, if we take this distance to road, it means that if the selection is constant, we can double the trend mean in 100 generations. So, it can lead to mock changes in the trend of a few generations, and it can appear quite huge, but it's what we found in the literature. So, in the literature, it is said that um, behavior have an availability of nearly 4%. As you can see on this graph, here you have the evolvability of behavior and you can see that uh, it has a wide range that encompass all the other um, fitness related traits evolvability. Yet, to make those predictions, we've made two assumptions. So the first assumption is that we suppose that there is directional selection in our population. And the second assumption is that we suppose that the traits are not constrained, which means that we suppose that there is no genetic variation among traits. Because we know that genetic variation can change direction and magnitude of selection. So it might be a particularly important problem because we know that behavior can be correlated and form what have been called behavioral syndromes. Furthermore, in the literature, it has been shown that behavioral syndromes uh, are underlined by genetic correlation and also might constrain the response to selection by a reduction of 33%. So 100% being the response when there is no correlation among traits. So we wanted to investigate if we could have uh, this problem in this population. And we did find, uh, find a behavioral syndrome with individuals that are more in open habitat that are also going to be close to road, but who are going to have a lower daily average speed. So this might not be surprising and may reflect the trade-off in um, risk avoidance and resource acquisition trade-off. For example, individuals by being more on open habitat will have access to higher uh, quality but also quantity of food and so we have to move less to satisfy their energetic need and we have a lower daily average speed. So those correlations were also found at the genetic level. For example, here you can see the correlation between daily average speed and being in open habitat with a genetic correlation of minus 0.9 but we have quite imprecise estimates so it means that the same genes or two genes in close association are going both to act on the behavior. And it also means that if selection acts on daily average speed, it might be constrained by its, its correlation with other behavioral traits. Yet for the moment, we need further investigation to understand if those kind of genetic correlation can constrain the response to selection. Um, furthermore, I, was, I told you that there was two, two assumptions. So the second assumption is that we hypothesize that there is directional selection in our population. But what do we know about selection in our population? So first, we know that there might be cooperation between reproductive success and space use because we know that individuals that use more meadows, so open habitats, are going to have a higher annual reproductive success. 
but what about survival? So we know little about survival, but we know that uh, in the population there is a high hunting intensity, and in the literature it has been shown that hunting might be an important selective pressure on behavior. So we can imagine that hunting can target individuals that use more open habitats, and hence hunting can select against high annual reproductive success. So, to sum up, it means that being in open habitat may provide a fitness trade-off between survival and reproduction. So, uh, it, it might be the population fluctuating selection rather than directional selection, but for the moment, it remains to be tested properly in the population. So, to conclude this second part, we have seen that there is differences among individuals in space use and in movement behavior. We have seen that spatial behavior might be transmitted to the next generation, which means that spatial behavior in raw deer are susceptible to change through macroevolutionary responses. Yet, we need some caution on it because we did not take into account um, all the uncontrolled conditions, and it's what I would like to talk about now. So, as I told you, it's possible that we misestimated how his, um, heritability estimate and particularly it might be upward bias for example because we did not take into account uh, maternal effects and we know that maternal effect can account for 10% of the phenotypic variation and even can increase heritability estimate um, on 15% furthermore we did not take into account shared environment among individuals and it has been shown in the literature, in some cases, to upward bias heritability. The problem is that if we misestimate heritability or genetic variation, we are also going to misestimate the evolutionary potential of population. And this might be particularly the case due to the road deer biology. For example, we know that juveniles are going to stay one year with their mothers, and at the age of nearly one, only one third of individuals are going to disperse and to go away from their mothers, while the other two thirds are going to stay nearby. So we should have a maternal effect, but we should also have a shared environment among individuals. So, um, in the literature, this kind of question, so if environmental similarity can bias evolutionary, the estimate of evolutionary potential, so there have been a handful of studies, but uh, most of the time it has been done by accounting for spatial proximity among individuals. So, um, supposing that individuals that are close in space are also going, uh, are going to share the same environment. And furthermore, across um, the few studies, there have been contrasting results according to studies. So we need a um, better understanding to try to draw a general pattern and to understand if this phenomenon can, can be um, common in the wild. So to do so, this time, we decompose phenotypic variation a little further. So we decompose phenotypic variation of the movement behavior. But this time we add a variation due to shared environment. So shared environment have been assessed through two different methods. First, uh, by accounting for spatial proximity among individuals. So what have been done for the moment in the literature. And after we also accounted for shared environment by calculating the similarity between individuals in the habitat what for the moment have never been done in empirically in the wild. So for that, we calculated uh, the home range of individual and inside the home range we estimated the percentage of middle, refuge, human infrastructure and patchiness. So after we can calculate um, an environmental similarity coefficient by pairs of individuals. So here you can see the distribution of environmental similarity going from O to 1. O being individuals have a really dissimilar kind of habitat composition 
and one being individual as strictly the same kind of habitat composition. So what you can see on this graph is a phenotypic uh, decomposition of uh, movement behavior. Heritability in that gray. So heritability might be a little bit different because it's not exactly the same fixed effect than previously. But what is important to note is that when we account for spatial proximity, all the heritability disappear. And when we account for environmental similarity, we do have the same result with heritability that go away. Conversely, you can see in blue the variation due to shared environment and in account for a large part of phenotypic variation, except for a daily average speed. So here we found a heritability that becomes weak and insignificant, uh, which is in line with what has been found in the literature. So um, this is mainly due to decrease in genetic variation and permanent environmental variation. So when we account for shared environment, it means that we, uh, we, should, we should have misestimated the genetic variation and the permanent environmental variation. So biologically, it means that relatives that share genes and wrong relatives that look alike um, share the same kind of environment. But does it mean we really misestimate the evolutionary potential? Well, not necessarily. First, because movement behavior is tightly linked to landscape composition and it might be difficult for the model to distinguish it. Uh, from, um, to distinguish it. So maybe we need to test it with other behavioral traits like vigilance behavior or docility. But we can also try this kind of model with other fitness-related traits, such as morphological or, or life history traits. On top of that, um, I was thinking also that we did not um, we did not think of something. We know that roe deer actively choose its habitat, so it's possible that environmental similarity or shared environment might be the result of habitat choice. And in the literature, we know that habitat choice might have a genetic basis. So it's possible that if there is genetic variation in habitat choice, there is also genetic variation in environmental similarity. So um, it might be difficult for us to distinguish between genes and environment. And while habitat choice have been well studied in ecology, and we know that there is among individual differences in habitat choice, we know little about mechanisms underlying habitat choice. So that's why, in the last part of my thesis, I've been interested in if there could be genetic variation in habitat composition, which is an outcome of habitat choice. So to do this, this time, we uh, considered environmental um, composition, habitat composition. So we decompose the phenotypic variation of percentage of meadow, percentage of refuge, human infrastructure, and patchiness inside the home range. We did it as usually, so first among and within individual variation, and then we go a little further with genetic and permanent variation, permanent environmental variation. <coughs> And finally, we also applied the spatial proximity method. So what you can see on this graph is the phenotypic decomposition of percentage of refugee, meadow, human infrastructure, and patchiness. And in that gray is the heritability of those different habitat compositions. So you can see that we have quite high heritability estimate for the moment. But when we account for spatial proximity, all the heritability go away and becomes weak and insignificant. So here, um, what does it mean? So we found heritability of habitat composition, which means that we do have a non-random distribution of genotypes. So genotypes are spatially clustered across the landscape. Furthermore, we also found that spatial proximity and environmental similarity drastically change the heritability estimate. 
So altogether, it means that we do have a correlation between genotype and environment. So it might be a problem because um, it might be a problem. So how are we going to distinguish genes from environment? For example, if we consider that shared environment is a, is a, uh, is part of genetic variation, we might uh, upward bias evolutionary potential estimate. Yet, if we consider that shared environment is part of permanent environmental variation, we might upward bias evolutionary potential. So what can we do with this? And one solution would be to understand mechanisms um, provoking this correlation. So this kind of question has been uh, mainly studied in human quantitative genetic uh, literature. Um, and there have been several hypotheses to explain genotype environment correlation. One of the first hypotheses is, for example, genetic variation in habitat choice. So the hypothesis that we've made. But there is much more hypothesis. For example, it could be due to non-random dispersal of genotypes. So we know in, the, in our population that there is non-random dispersal, but we do not know how it's linked to genotypes. So if, it, if it's only some genotypes that disperse and go away, we are going also to find, again, a correlation between environment and genotype. Finally, another uh, mechanism possible is just passive mechanisms. And it happens, for example, when the parents are going to provide both the genes and the environment, which is going to influence the offspring traits. So for the moment, we did not disentangle between genes and environment, but we have some um, avenues to do it, for example. Uh, we can try another sampling strategies, so by, um, sam by sampling individuals that disperse and go away. But if it's not possible, we can do it through simulation studies and try to test with different distance of dispersal, different um, percentage of disperser, to see if we can dis disentangle between genes and environment. We can also try to use a multivariate approach. So we are going to study uh, the covariation, the genetic covariation between behavior and environment. And we can uh, also say that environment is influencing behavior. Finally, and it's what I've been currently doing, is that we can assess behavior and environmental similarity at multiple spatial and temporal scales because it's something which is perpetually changing and might be, and maybe yes, in some scales we will not have any more this genotype environment correlation. So, to put it in a nutshell, we, the aim of this thesis was to decompose the phenotypic variation in space use and movement behavior. For this, we used general palatinous matrices and quantitative genetic animal model, thus to understand if there could be changes in phenotype. So we were mainly inter interested if there could be a um, change in phenotype driven by genetically mechanisms, and we've shown that it might be possible because there is heritability in space use and movement behavior. But during my thesis, I've also been interested in that could be environmentally uh, driven mechanisms. And we have shown that it might be possible because, for example, uh, individuals uh, do not address their movement in the same way in response to hunting. So there was among individual variation in plasticity. Finally, during the thesis, we have also demonstrated that we have a problem of genotype environmental correlation and so for the moment um, we, could not, uh, we could not distinguish clearly genes from environment. So in conclusion, it means that despite new technologies, it has been really and it's still challenging to assess evolutionary potential in the wild. But does it mean we should stop studies in the wild? I don't think so. I think that we both need a combination of experimental and natural design. For example, Burberry and colleagues did um, cross-fostering, so they exchanged the eggs in the nest of eagle holes, and then they studied movement behavior. 
and they have shown that movement was not due to common genetic origin, but were rather due to common rearing environments. So here they distinguish between genes and environment. But experimental design is not possible for every species, and here I think that genomic relatedness matrices might be a solution. Because with genomic relatedness matrices, it's possible to calculate heritability but also evolvability with only distant relatives. So you're not going to have any more confounded effects between genes and environment. So this has been mainly done in the human quantitative genetic uh, literature, but it has been shown to be quite data hungry. So for the moment, we do not know if it might be possible to do it in white uh, non-human animal population. So altogether, it means that we need to expand the field of genomic quantitative genetic studies, and it's what I would like to discuss now. So, uh, with all that said, we might wonder what are we going to do about our um, heritability estimate. So, I would like to stress that evolutionary potential is all the phenotypic variation um, which provides a fitness benefit and is transmitted to the next generation. So, if, if those uh, two uh, assumptions are met, uh, it means that phenotypic variation can respond to selection. And this, whatever the kind of transmission it is, even if it's non-genetic transmission, so it has been shown in the literature that there might be non-genetic inheritance. So, if we go back to our results, we demonstrated in the last part of my talk that relative chair environment and furthermore, that there was limited dispersal. So, the genes and environment are biologically confronted. It means that habitat has the potential to be transmitted to the next generation, so to be inherited, whatever the kind of transmission it is. So, how our heritability estimate might be a first approach of what have been called inclusive heritability. So, we are going to estimate all the percentage of phenotypic variation which is transmitted to the next generation, whatever the kind of transmission it is. Yet, we need some caution on it for the moment, because um, non-genetic mechanisms may have different uh, rules, different evolutionary dynamics, so um, it might be a problem to make prediction. So, for the moment, we need to have a further uh, knowledge on it. But what I would like to stress is that habitat either being genetically or non-genetically transmitted might impact evolutionary process. For example, habitat choice can lead to change environment, so it might change the selective pressure, and this might induce plastic response in behavioral, physiological and life history threats, but also it can induce genetic response in uh, those threats. Furthermore, um, those threats can act back on the habitat choice and change environment and so on. So it's possible that habitat choice and more generally environmental heterogeneity have co evaluate with uh, those uh, fitness related threats. Yet, this has been rarely taken into account when we study the co-evolution between threats. And this is surprising because we know that co variation between threats might change according to environmental context. For example, if we go back to our population, we found that individuals that are more in open habitat, more close to road, and that have a lower daily average speed, were individuals inhabiting a quite patchy habitat, close to human, um, close to road, and also were individuals that were that was heavier, and um, particularly. Um, we found a correlation only half of the year. So it means that environmental heterogeneity, either being spatial or temporal, might um, have an influence on the coevolution among threats, and, those, and this might also have an influence on the evolutionary potential of population. So that's why I think we need to integrate uh, further environmental heterogeneity in quantitative genetic studies. So, for now, environment have been explicitly integrated in quantitative genetic studies, for example, by the studies of genotype by environment interaction, or by anti genetic effect, more recently, shared environment, 
So we know that there is an interplay between genes and environment. But to expand quantitative genetic framework, what we could do is, for example, integrate habitat information when we study the coevolution on the thread, so just that what I told you before. But we can also try to understand what, our, what, what we call it environment. Is environment a choice? Is it a constraint? But if it is a choice, what are the mechanisms underlying this choice? And lastly, uh, we can also try to expand molecular quantitative genetic approach. For the moment, it has been quite underrated, and particularly for behavior. So, to conclude this talk, um, we found that um, genomic and biologic technologies help us to expand the study of evolutionary potential to new organisms and also to new fitness related trends. Yet, to take full advantage of this advance, we need to more empirical and also more theoretical studies to understand what are the mechanisms underlying what we call environment. And finally, I will finish with this. Uh, we found that space use and movement behavior might have the potential to respond to selection, and so we need further studies on it to investigate it. So, thank you all for your attention, thank you for your help. I would like to thank my supervisors and also all my collaborators, and I think I must have forgotten a lot of people on this slide. Thank you.